This is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and today I've got the pleasure of interviewing Grandmaster Ron W. Henley. So how's everything going today, Ron? Well, fantastic. Should I mention it's my birthday? All right. Well, happy birthday, Ron. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is not uh, one of my normal Grandmaster interviews. We are going to be talking a, a little bit about Ron's background in chess and, and how he came to, uh, you know, came about uh, obtaining this Grandmaster title. But the real purpose of this video is uh, we're, it's kind of a launch party for Ron. You know, we're very excited to uh, announce uh, having him uh, join the online chesslessons.net team. So while we're excited, why don't you tell, uh, you know, our viewers why they should be excited and what they can expect to see from Grandmaster Ron W. Henley in the near future. Well, thanks. First off, really appreciate the opportunity to join the online chesslessons.net team and Secondly, when chess players do have time to study, they want to get the maximum amount of return for their efforts in terms of playing improvement. So we're talking tactics, will, and openings. Bam, bam, tactics and openings. That's what we're going to focus on to help players improve. All right, excellent. So, you know, let's, let's go ahead and, and keep moving. I, I wanted to give a, a brief background myself for those of y'all who, who aren't uh, so familiar with Ron's work. He's uh, best known in the chess world for having worked very closely with none other than former world chess champion Anatoly Karpov, uh, specifically working with him as a second analyst and trainer throughout, I think it was almost 10 matches throughout the 1990s when Karpov was, was still killing it. So um, let's, let's go ahead and get started with the interview. You know, I, I, I just like to... Um, you know, give our viewers a, a little bit of background about you, Ron. So when did you learn how to play chess and uh, who taught you? Well, I actually learned from my stepbrothers. We had a little game block when I was a kid, Parcheesi, Chinese checkers and everything. But the real breakthrough was not until I was about 15. You know, I beat all my schoolmasters and teachers and neighbors and scoutmasters and whatever. But the real breakthrough, Will, was when I was 15, my sister saw an article in the New York Post about uh, someone wrote in about Star Trek. And the 3D episode where Captain Kirk is uh, playing Spock. And so the commentator's like, nope, don't know the rules, but Hughes Chess Club, 4714 Fannin Street, and someone there will hook you up. My father took me down there, paid my USCF dues, my Texas Chess Association dues. I played in a tournament that weekend. That was 1972. Never looked back. All right. And uh, how did you start doing these tournaments that, that you, you, know, you started playing in then? Oh, my first tournament will <laughs> one out of five and my next tournament one and a half out of five. But the point is, I started out with a USCF rating of 1465. So don't ever let anyone tell you it's not possible to go from there to master to grandmaster. But it requires work. Okay. And, and can, you, can you recall, you know, a specific turning point when you just... You know, all of a sudden it just started clicking, maybe working with a coach or any specific games or events, anything like that earlier in your career? Well, one, one of the big keys, Will, is that was before the days of computers. So information was much harder to come by. Experience was much harder to come by. But I was very fortunate that I was told early on, study the history of the game. And later Karpov confirmed that to me because he said, each world champion stands on the shoulders of the people that came before him. And so that was very important. So... I started with the early history, Morphy, Steinitz, Tarash, and each of these great players had something to contribute to the game. And so I think that helped me build a really solid foundation. Okay, excellent. So we had scheduled for the viewers just to take a, a quick peek at one of the uh, games from, uh, let's see, it was the, the 15th round of a super tournament where Ron scored his final, his third Grandmaster Norm. So why don't we go ahead and flip over and uh, take a look at this game. So this was Ron Henley playing Rafaelito Mananang. And uh, just to kick things off here, so let's see. Ron uh, was playing white here, and he opened up with d4. And so now answered by knight f6. And uh, after e6 and, and now 3b6, Mananang was, was playing the, uh, the Queen's Indian defense. So how was your preparation in this tournament, you know, going into it? How, how were you feeling comfortable and, and what were you really trying to get out of the opening? Well, I was very fortunate in that tournament. I had six-time U.S. champion Walter Brown working with me on the openings. 
And of course, Walter at that time was one of the world's foremost authorities on the Queen's Indian. So I was really booked up. I was revved. Uh, with white in this tournament, I had 10 wins and two draws. And then with black, of course, I had to run the gauntlet. I was playing all the top players with black. So this particular game that we're looking at, uh, Gary, of course, had just burst onto the scene. Gary Kasparov, that is. And uh, this 4A3 that you see in this game, called a Petrosian system after, you know, the previous world champion Tigran Petrosian. But the difference was Petrosian would play it as kind of a quiet preventive move. Kasparov took this and he really molded it into a weapon. Capture the center and then bam, go after the king. And I think this game kind of epitomizes the kind of fighting spirit for the initiative that players like Walter Brown and Kasparov in that era, you know, really brought to the table. So I was heavily influenced, you know, in that direction here. Okay, excellent. So, so I've got the board all set up on my side after 4A3, so why don't you go ahead and uh, take us through the game and, and kind of your thoughts and, and everything like that as we go through it. Okay, let me see if I... Uh, trying to pull it up here. I'm having trouble. Okay, there we go. So let's see, I think after 4A3... Um, he lashed out with c5 here, so this is a pretty interesting move. You don't really see this so much from players in the Queen's Indian defense, but it seems like a really natural response to me to, you know, white playing a3. Why shouldn't black kind of try to strike at the center while white is, you know, maybe wasting a move or, or whatever you want to call it playing a3? No, that's a very good point, Will. And so with c5, the game started, and then, of course, the only way to try for an advantage for white after c5 is to play d5. And the game takes on a bit more of a characteristic of a Benoni. And then his bishop to a6 is also very sharp because that attacks the base of my pawn chain with at c4. So queen c2, again, is the only move to try for an advantage. And now he captures on d5. But note, he can't capture a second time with the knight, you know, after 7, c takes d5. He can't play knight takes because queen e4 check. And I'll snag, you know, the knight, the rook, the king, you know, all under attack. But he plays bishop back, and this is very clever because he now double attacks the pawn on d5. Once I defend it with e4, queen e7, very consistent, and he now is attacking the e-pawn twice, and he's got a pin on the e-pawn, so the d-pawn is actually under attack. But again, all worked out by greater minds than myself. Kasparov had been down this path, and uh, Brown had played a game, actually, I think where Brown was actually black against Dahlberg, uh, master out in California. So after Castles, now, of course, the knight from d5 has to move, goes back to c7, and knight's bishop to g5 attacking the queen. You can see white, uh, black is a long way from getting castled kingside, so, of course, queenside is his only option, so... The idea with bishop to g5 is, you know, see what we can do to keep that king in the middle a little while longer. So, of course, he plays f6, back up the bishop. Now he gets his knight out. He's ready to run queenside. We go knight c3. He castles. And now, rook e1. Fairly sophisticated move. We call this the x-ray, right, Will? We put the rook opposite the black queen. Now, there's no obvious immediate benefit but experienced players know that tactical opportunities will be, you know, arising once you have your rook opposite their queen, opposite their king, okay? So, and we'll see such an opportunity. He plays g5. Well, g5 is part of his program to try and develop some kind of initiative on the king side against my king. But rather than just back up the bishop, again, keep in mind I was influenced by very, very sharp, challenging players like uh, Kasparov and Brown at every minute they're looking for some way to get just a little bit of an edge to get some initiative to get some punch with the white pieces and so here bam i slammed in knight d5 this attacks his queen also threatens to try and swap off that knight on c7 that's one of the defenders of the black king i mean it's pretty clear here that white has to play actively to get compensation for the sacrificed pawn but on the other hand if you look at our development all of our pieces except maybe the rook on a1 are mobilized okay so, he plays queen to g7, and now the bishop drops back to g3. He plays d6 to shield off the attack on the knight on c7. And now b4. This is the only pawn break pretty much that we still have left for white in the position. And uh, this became kind of the textbook for how to crack this type of defensive formation for black. Benjamin, I think, later 
won a game, you know, with this type of B4 pawn break. Now black plays knight e5. And this was actually the most difficult move of the game for me, to tell you the truth, in spite of what occurs later, and required a lot of calculation. He's threatening my bishop on d3. He's threatening my knight on f3. He's threatening my knight on d5 twice. What to do? What do you think, Will? Well, it's a pretty complicated position. You know, I mean, if you allow knight takes f3, it looks like it's going to kind of cripple your king's side. But at the same but, time, if you if you play knight takes e5, then he plays d takes maybe, and it, you know, attacks even more than knight on d5. So, so oh, also after knight e5 and he plays d takes e5, hard to see a future for the bishop on g3 for quite some time. You see? Definitely, yes. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I've, I've already seen the game, so I, I'm kind of yeah. cheating well, here. Well, that, but, uh... but you can see there was a lot to think about during the course of the game. And plus, you know, forget about opening preparation here. It's mano y mano here. Whoever gets to the king first gets the gold. You know? sure <laughs> so here I played a4. And this move, you know, uh, an incredible amount of calculation because there's all kinds of variations. Well, he can take on f3, for example, and try to play h5 and trap my bishop. But while he's doing that, of course, I'm playing a5, and I'm trying everything I can to blast open the queen side. In the game, he played h5 right away, keeping his options. And now here I uh, saw some clarity to the position, and I realized I'm not going to be able to preserve the bishop on g3. And I also realized if I'm going to win this game, it's going to be on the light squares. Now, that's kind of hard to conceive at this point, but... Half the squares on the board are dark squares, half the squares are light squares. So let's see how play develops. First, I give up the dark squared bishop, get rid of his knight, he takes, and then, bam, full steam ahead. We don't worry about the pawn on d5. So he captures once, and now he decides he wants to get his king over and try to protect the a-file. So, of course, we open the a-file, and then, very nice move, bishop to e4. And now we can start to see what we're talking about with the light squares because... I wanted to stop you here, Ron, because when I was first looking at this game, this is the kind of move that is extremely tough to see and it's even tougher to teach. You know, this this kind of quiet move, the, the calm before the storm. So what do you have? Do you have any advice for, for the viewers out there? You know, how do you train yourself to find these kind of quiet moves? This bishop e4, you know, just subtly, yeah. you know, preparing for the position to open where that bishop is, is just going to be, you know, perfectly placed. Yeah, now that that's a very good question, Will, and this is a very tough one to explain because, again, remember earlier I put my rook opposite his queen and we had kind of an x-ray thing going there? Well, here we have an x-ray with a bishop against a bishop to start with there of equal value, plus it's x-raying through my pawn. Uh, the point, though, is tactical, and it required serious calculation. If you go back a move, he's threatening to capture the pawn on d5. By putting the bishop here, I keep him from capturing that pawn because if bishop takes d5, I play bishop takes, rook takes, and not queen a2 because then he can play queen b7 and protect the rook and stop the dastardly check on a8. But you have to be able to invert the move order sometimes in your mind. So let's go back. Bishop takes, bishop takes, rook takes. And then rook a8 check, exclamation point. Very unpleasant because now after king takes, then we go queen a2 check. And then we get the queen taking the rook back on d5 next move. And then let's assess that position. Well, in that position, I'm going to have all my pieces very active and his king on the queen side. And he's going to have all his rest of his forces over on the queen side. Okay, so from there you could work out the concrete variations, but from a philosophical point of view, you, you can understand the reasoning. Uh, but again, it was important to be able to invert the move and to see that calculation. You see what I mean? Definitely, but, yeah. I mean, it, it definitely makes, makes a lot of sense. So I, I guess what I try, the way I try to explain it and understand it better myself is that you know a lot of times when my students and we're looking at like these crazy grandmaster games and, and stuff like this you know where you you're kind of wondering bishop e4 i mean what you know this is the move of the game and the way i the, the best way for me to explain it and understand it myself is that there's not always such a a concrete just you know lightning bolt in a chess game 
a lot of times yeah. you're just building up the pressure and building it with moves like rookie one and bishop e4 and when the position finally does open up and everything goes crazy then you're perfectly placed for it no no but actually your point is extremely well well taken will because you know later when you look over this game bishop d4 is not even a move that usually would cross your mind until you've looked at it a bit more in depth and so let's see what happened well, he's still, let's look at this position. He's got problems. I've got the open A-file. His queen, his bishop, and his rook on the king side are still all over there. He hasn't really mounted any kind of serious threat against my king side yet. And so what he does next is he figures he'll capture the pawn on B4 and get a beautiful outpost for his bishop on C5. So now I'm, what, two pawns down, and he, he has the bishop here. But there's dynamics and there's static. And here, the dynamics favor me. First, queen to a4. This threatens to play queen a7 check. He uh, follows through with his plan of bishop to c5. And then again, in similar vein to the bishop e4 move, you have to appreciate the squares. And, and in this game, I really played what we call line chess. Rooks on open files, bishops on diagonals. So the rook on e1 has done its job. Now it goes to c1. Again, this creates tactical possibilities for example, once I give queen a7 check, at some point I might be able to play rook takes on c5 check. Or let's say I play queen a7 check and he goes king c8, I can play queen takes b6 and break down his defense. So the point here is if I'm able to break down his defense, the other thing too, if he tries to flee with his king at this point, I can play queen takes b4, you see? But again, rook c1 is very similar in nature to the bishop e4 move all designed to keep him from trying to run out of town on me, you see? Definitely. So I saw here Black was trying to consolidate with Queen to D or, or Queen C7. What do you think Black's best defense is here? You know, Actually, I was, I was thinking about that earlier. Maybe Queen E7, but he might run into the same issues as in the game. But for example, again, he can't capture on D5. He, he may very well be lost, frankly, because let's look at it in terms of force, okay? And by force, I don't mean material, I mean force as in pieces affecting a sector. And if we look at his king side, I have a rook, another rook, a queen, and a bishop, and a pawn. So what are we looking at there? About 23, 24 points of material that all potentially could be focused as, at his king. That's, that's a lot of juice, right? <laughs> and so if he tries to play, for example, bishop takes d5, we have bishop takes, rook takes, and queen a8 check snags the, uh, the, the rook on d5 if, if we don't play queen to the seventh check and snag his queen. Also, if he tries to play rook takes d5, figuring, okay, I'll bail out, I'll sack the exchange, I'll survive. No, no, no. On rook takes d5, we go queen a7 check, and then we take the rook off on d5. You see? So it's really not easy. And again, if he tries to run flee with his king, I may just play queen takes on b4 and threaten to follow up with a sacrifice on c5. Um, maybe king c7 and queen e7, maybe, might, might be the best way to go. But again, no easy out here because we also sometimes, keep in mind this bishop on e4 can always switch to the f5 check diagonal as well. So, you know, there's a lot of force here that's, you know, hovering close to his king uh, within striking distance. So I'm not sure. I haven't really put it into a search engine in all these years. So uh, maybe queen e7, but again, d6 might be a problem for him. Yeah, in so, all the lines that I looked at in, in trying to prepare for this, you know, going over this game and everything, none of them looked really good for black. I, I didn't find a, a very concrete way where he's, he's getting out of the attack without losing a lot of material. So yeah. I saw the game finished up. Uh, he tried queen c7, and mm -hmm. that one just lost on the spot. I, I saw you just d6. and Yeah, and, and even this is a very nice clearance-type sacrifice because that latent bishop on e4 that we talked about being an x-ray opposition to his bishop, suddenly it comes to life. And even the little pawn, the little pawnlet on d5 that he could never take, when it goes to d6, he wants to capture it because it's covering the vital c7 escape square. And so in the end, you know, a game like this looks quite pretty. But again, like you said, it's those little quiet moves like rook e1, bishop e4, later rook c1 that uh, really build this up. So, Will, you want to walk him through how this d6 move works? Sure. So d6 is um, 
pretty simple. I mean, it, you know, bishop takes d6. Obviously, it's not going to work. Rook takes c7. It's going to lose a, a lot of lose the queen. And if rook takes d6, this was a really nice shot. Um, queen to a8, and this is going to just lead to sacking the queen for the bishop, leading to a mate on a8. And yes. um, also, I, I guess the only other option, you know, you got to move the queen. If you try something like, I don't know, let's say queen d7, the same idea, the pawn on d6 is going to be covering the c7 square, and queen a8 is going to lead to a, a nice queen sack again from me. And, yes, and, and um, to, I guess to Raf Rafaelito Manoneng's credit, he studied the position for a little while, and then he resigned, you know. <laughs> I like that. And I guess the last choice, queen takes d6, simply uh, queen to a7 check, and followed by queen takes b7 is going to be mate. So that that's an epulent mate, by the way, right? An <laughs> yeah, they give these things names, you know. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess we're we're kind of running out of time for today, Ron. And I, I definitely appreciate you taking the time to introduce yourself to the uh, online chesslessons.net community and um, myself. And I'm sure all of our viewership included are, are very excited to see some more. Grandmaster Ron W. Henley Productions coming in the future. Well, very excited. Looking forward to it. We're going to have a lot of sacrifices, queen sacrifices, like you saw in this game, chess tactics, and definitely some openings. All right, definitely. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us today, Ron, and uh, you have a nice night. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Take care. All right. Thank you, sir.